Namaste, my dear brothers and sisters. The love and blessings of the mother and Sri Aurobindo to all of you from Sri Aurobindo Ashram Delhi branch. Today's session, uh, which has uh, no specific topic, and yet there is a lot that uh, one could say, and uh, the focus is on uh, questions, answers, some tips, and uh, then look at uh, where we go ahead from this module yes.04. In general, I find that uh, there are very few questions that uh, you have. And uh, you might have seen that uh, in such situations, what the to say, if you don't have any questions, then I'll ask you questions. I'll also do that. I'll ask you some questions, but then I'll also give the answers. And uh, then uh, hopefully there'll be some time left for you to ask questions. And in the meantime, if any questions occur to you, you can keep writing them in chat. Sometimes there's a fear of asking questions because one feels that the question may not be a good question. It may be an indiscreet question. Or... But then questions are never indiscreet. Answers sometimes are. I love Oscar Wilde for his sense of humor, uh, which uh, has uh, a lot of wisdom sometimes packed in humor. Let's start with a few quick questions. Yoga is a set of postures that uh, take about an hour a day, a system of medicine, an easy way to good health, a way of life based on the spiritual view of life. The first alternative, a set of postures that take about an hour a day, is uh, quite in keeping with uh, the popular image of yoga. But then uh, we have seen that that's not really true. The postures form only a very small part of yoga and not the most uh, essential part. It's not the postures that make it a spiritual discipline, but something else. Yoga is not even a system of medicine. Although good health can be a byproduct of yoga, yoga is not even an easy way to good health because yoga is neither easy nor was it designed for being healthy. No yoga is easy. Yoga is a way of life based on the spiritual view of life. That comes closest to what yoga is out of these four alternatives. It is a way of life based on a certain view of life and that view of life is the spiritual view of life and uh, that's what makes it a spiritual discipline. And uh, that's what the answer is. Then ego, the much maligned ego, which of course has been planted in us with a purpose and serves a lot, serves us very well, not only on the worldly path, but also on the spiritual path for quite a long distance. Ego expresses itself as a feeling of separation from others, that is being a distinct individual with the distinct needs and aspirations. And that certainly is true. That's how ego expresses itself. It expresses, does it express itself as uh, our views being better than somebody else's? Yes, that is also a form that it takes. Our guru being better than somebody else's, that's the collective ego, which expresses in many ways, our guru being better than somebody else's, our language being better than somebody else's, our country being better than any other country, and so on. So that is... Uh, Another way in which ego expresses itself in the form of the collective ego. So ego expresses itself through all these separation from others, our views being better than somebody else's, our guru being better than somebody else's. The purpose of life can be addressed best by reading scriptures, listening to discourses, making the right choices in life, giving money in charity. 
reading scriptures yes it is good but then uh, that will only give us knowledge and uh, that is only the first step what is important is practice and uh, for that we have to go beyond reading spending too much time on reading can make it difficult to practice one secondly reading can become mechanical if we pick up just one scripture and uh, as a mechanical routine read a few pages of it every day that can get reduced to a mechanical exercise then listening to discourses that also can become uh, a more passive way of uh, gaining knowledge as compared to reading but all the same still it may remain at the level of knowledge one may put very little into practice then making the right choices in life yes that of course is crucial and is one of the ways in which the purpose of life can be addressed and one of the major means right choices that is right choices are those which uh, come to us from the psychic being that is uh, from that inner voice which always tells us clearly and quickly in no unmistakable terms that uh, uh in unmistakable terms in unmistakable terms that uh, this is the only thing to do this is the right thing to do giving money in charity well that can be one of the expressions of the love that we feel for others which is uh, what the psychic being is about but then that by itself that act by itself will not necessarily fulfill the purpose of life although done in the right way in the right spirit it can be one of the contributors to fulfilling the purpose of life so essentially the uh, best alternative of all these of all these remains making the right choices in life stress results from unfulfilled desires yes uh, that can lead to stress but then fulfilled desires also can lead to stress stress results from high expectations yes the expectations are too high too unrealistic that can lead to stress bad events in life yes uh it's easy to say but difficult to remain unaffected by bad events in life but then uh, life being what it is there will always be always be some desires which will remain unfulfilled some expectations which are too high to be fulfilled and uh, some bad events in life also will keep occurring and therefore if one has to uh, remain free from stress uh, in real life it will never be possible unless we change our attitude to life if we look upon uh, all events including the bad events as an opportunity for spiritual growth uh, we will not be able to remain free from stress and of course uh, once uh, we are on the spiritual path desires may be there but then we also know that all of them cannot be fulfilled the desires will be few the intensity will be low and uh, we will be able to overcome desires easily so unfulfilled desires high expectations again one may expect anything but then be disappointed by nothing that is the type of samatva the uh, equality equality that is expecting that is accepting everything with equal delight that is what uh, uh, the spiritual path does so essentially uh, stress results out of all these alternatives although any of these could lead to stress ordinarily in the underlying root cause the most important cause Uh, is uh, our attitude to life. If our attitude to life is such that uh, we do not uh, look upon what happens in life as an opportunity for spiritual growth, stress will always be there because any of these things can always happen. So the stress does not really reside in what happens; it resides in the way we look at it. And therefore, uh, the means of resolving stress is. positive thinking that is to find something positive in what has happened and there's always something positive in whatever happens even when apparently there's nothing positive there's always at least one thing positive about everything that happens it is an opportunity for spiritual growth which is the very purpose of life so positive thinking means being optimistic in all situations and uh, that is possible if we are able to accept 
whatever has happened, no matter how unpleasant, as uh, a gift from the divine. We accept with prasad buddhi as prasad from the divine because we needed it. We needed it for our spiritual growth, which uh, all situations are capable of uh, stimulating. So it was given to us for stimulating our spiritual growth, for helping us fulfill the purpose of our life. So that's how we can be optimistic in all situations. And also that uh, it will not last forever. It will go because the divine is with me and the divine knows what is best for me. So long as it is necessary, it will be there. When it is not necessary, it will go. So being optimistic in all situations. Positive thing does not mean adding to our thoughts. That is, uh, keep adding more and more. You know, addition is also positive. So it's not that we keep on increasing the number of our thoughts by adding to our thoughts. Certainly that is a rather funny choice, but all the same, uh, literally it could mean that, positive thinking. Then having better thoughts. Uh, positive can be not just quantitative, also qualitative. Having better type of thoughts, very nice. One should have better thoughts, but uh, that's not all what positive thinking is about. Positive thinking is about seeing something positive in all situations. Then controlling our thoughts, uh, that again is not really positive thinking. Uh, we think, but do we think optimistically? We think in such a way that uh, we find something positive in all situations. That is what positive thinking is about. So out of these four alternatives, the best appears to be being optimistic in all situations. We all want to be happy. But uh, happiness is something that is coupled with sorrow. What we can expect is a steady peace. Peace is far more important and uh, more valuable, more enjoyable than happiness, which is coupled with sorrow. Happiness is a part of the dualities of life. Peace is not. And where does it come from? Acting on the voice of the psychic being. Yes, the choices given to us by the psychic being are inspired by love. And when we act on that voice, we not only get immense joy, we also get lasting mental peace because then we have no regrets that uh, I did not do the right thing. Can peace come from looking forward to a good life after death? Just a sort of a consolation that, well, uh, this life is meant to be miserable. This world is full of sorrow. That is what the nature of worldly life is. And therefore, the I can look for peace, I can expect peace only in another life which I may get after death. That's not really true. Uh, one can have a good life after death in another world, but then one doesn't have to wait for that. One can have peace in this life, in this world, if we live well, if our goal in life is uh, as to use the mother's words, high and wide, generous and disinterested, which eventually boils down to the goal of life being something that looks at something beyond our little self, looks it is uh, wide enough to embrace others and uh, not just embrace others, but to act out of love for others. Does peace come from attributing all our misfortunes to sins of past lives? That may give us an explanation, but the explanation is not enough to actually generate peace. And uh, whether all our misfortunes are necessarily because of sins of past lives, that also is something questionable. That is a sort of a consolation, but all the same, that does not bring too much peace. And uh, then losing discrimination between good and evil. Why get into trouble? Stay at peace. Uh, don't bother about what is going on. Uh, do not discriminate between good and evil. Do what you enjoy doing and let others continue to do whatever they are doing. Don't bother about it. Now, that can uh, not again give us really lasting mental peace. Because peace is not about losing discrimination between good and evil. It is about uh, uh, accepting the 
presence of good and evil and choosing good. It is not about losing discrimination between good and evil. If we look upon uh, uh, all those around us as manifestations of the divine, does not mean that uh, we lose discrimination between good and evil. What we lose is the hatred for the one who is indulging in what we consider evil. So, hate the evil doer, sorry, hate evil, not the evil doer. So, one can love all, one need not like all. One can love all, but at the same time, if uh, there is evil going on around, then we will keep that discrimination. We will have our dislike for the evil, not for the evil doer. So losing discrimination between good and evil is not the way to peace. So peace comes essentially from acting on the voice of the psychic being. Which is better, to maintain body weight by eating very little and taking no exercise or eating in moderation and taking exercise? It may be possible to maintain body weight by, in both the, through both the alternatives. But then uh, the second alternative not only allows us uh, a little pressure of eating in moderation instead of being under the stress of all the time counting our calories, the second alternative also includes exercise which can be not only useful in many ways, other than maintaining weight, it can also be enjoyable. In fact, ex exercise can be a very pleasant experience. And uh, particularly the way the yogic postures are done, they are very relaxing and therefore uh, can become addicting. And therefore, uh, uh, it's much better uh, to eat in moderation and take exercise rather than eat very little so that we have to take no exercise for maintaining body weight. Exercise is not just for maintaining body weight. Exercise has many, many benefits that go beyond just helping us shed a few or burn a few calories or shed a few pounds of weight. So eating in moderation and taking exercise is uh, much better because exercise is uh, uh, not only for maintaining weight, it has many other benefits too. Now coming to sleep, how much time does one really save by sleeping late and sleeping less? It's an illusion that I'm getting more time to work if I sleep late and sleep less. Because uh, if one sleeps late and sleeps less, one becomes less efficient during the day. And uh, therefore, one may take more time to do the same work. Secondly, one uh, develops poor health and therefore the time saved apparently saved, and that's why in quotes, may be spent on uh, visiting doctors and hospitals. And therefore, what is apparently saved is more than neutralized by reduced efficiency and by increased illness. Why may a person having 90% block in the coronary arteries and uh, still have no symptoms? So a person, may, a person may have 90% block in the coronary arteries and still have no symptoms. And that's because uh, the symptoms depend upon the blood flow to the heart. And the blood flow doesn't depend on just the blood vessels which we see blocked in the uh, angiogram because uh, although the arteries in the heart are end arteries, that is... Uh, an artery supplies a certain uh, area, uh, it has a certain area of blood supply and does not supply the neighboring areas which are supplied by another artery. So each artery has its independent territory of supply. So in that sense, they are end arteries. But all the same, under uh, a stimulus of a challenge, uh, these arteries can proliferate. They can proliferate to develop what is called collaterals. That is, new blood vessels which become alternative channels of circulation, alternative channels for blood flow to neighboring areas. And therefore, 
uh, what is possible is that uh, an artery may be blocked to the extent of 90%, but the territory that it was supplying is now being supplied by another artery, uh, which not, was not initially supplying it, but now is able to supply it because of this proliferation. So the area that is, uh, the artery that is blocked, its function, its territory of supply has been taken over by another neighboring artery. And uh, what is the stimulus uh, for uh, this type of circulation to develop? The stimulus is the demand being a little more than the supply. So the maximum supply that can come from an artery which has started getting blocked, uh, if we provide a little challenge so that the maximum that this blocked artery can provide uh, is just a little less than is necessary, a little less than the demand, then there will be a stimulus for the development of these new blood vessels. And this is a process that can start quite early when the artery was just 30 or 40 percent blocked. And, uh, and therefore, as the block was pro progressing, as the block was increasing, the collateral circulation was also increasing. And what is it that can provide that challenge? Exercise. So regular physical activity helps by providing that stimulus so that uh, there will be periodically a challenge in which the capacity of these partially blocked arteries to supply the blood will not be uh, enough to meet the demand. When it is not in able to, when the supply is not able to meet the demand, the, there will be a stimulus for increasing the supply by developing alternative channels of circulation from neighboring arteries. So as the block develops, as the block progresses, the collateral circulation also progresses, that also keeps increasing. So that by the time the artery is 90% or more than 90% blocked, the collateral circulation has taken over almost completely the function of supplying blood to this area, which was being supplied by the artery, which is now 90% blocked. So this person has been developing collaterals, uh, alternative channels of blood supply while the block was progressing. And that's why in spite of having a 90% block, the person has no symptoms. This is what has been shown in this uh, picture, beautiful picture. This is the normal circulation. But then uh, here, this is blocked. Now, if this is blocked, uh, the blood cannot flow beyond this. So the blood can go here, the blood can go here, but the blood cannot go here. So this area suffers from lack of blood supply. But then what happens is that this neighboring artery that develops this new channel so that uh, this block gets bypassed. Instead of coming like this, now the blood is coming to this area like this. Like this. So these are the new blood vessels, the collateral blood vessels that have developed, which can make up, which can compensate for this block here. So it's a sort of a natural bypass, bypassing the block. Why is abdominal breathing better than thoracic breathing? Abdominal breathing means breathing uh, in such a way that breathing in is the result of the diaphragm going down. The diaphragm is the partition between the chest and the abdomen. So when that goes down, the capacity of the chest increases. And when the capacity of the chest increases, the pressure there falls. And as a result of fall in pressure, the air goes in, that is we breathe in. Now, when the diaphragm goes down, the partition between the chest and the abdomen goes down, it presses on the intestines and therefore the abdomen goes out. So as we breathe in, the abdomen moves out. So that is abdominal breathing. This is much more efficient than thoracic breathing in which we use the intercostal muscles to expand the chest, uh, expand the chest sideways and from the front to the back. So that is uh, the uh, thoracic breathing. Now those little, little uh, intercostal muscles, and they take a lot more effort to increase the capacity of the chest uh, a little bit. Whereas the diaphragm, a big muscle between the chest and the abdomen, 
just a little movement of that big muscle is able to increase the capacity of the chest to a much greater extent. So because the capacity of the chest can be increased to a much greater extent, we can breathe in a lot more air. We can breathe in a lot more air as a result of this movement of the diaphragm, which takes relatively less effort. So with less effort, we can move more air, and that is why abdominal breathing is better. But then because of the type of dresses we wear, most of us become chest breathers. The abdomen is, uh, uh, can't move much because of the belt, etc. that we have around the waist. And therefore, we become chest breathers. To recover the habit of abdominal breathing, not only our dresses should be uh, changed accordingly, but uh, also we should practice it uh, during our yogic practices in Shavasana. Because easiest to breathe abdominally, breathe through the abdomen, while lying down. A little less easy sitting, and it is most difficult in the standing posture. And uh, therefore, to get back to abdominal breathing, to once again get into the habit of abdominal breathing, the best posture to start is the lying down posture, particularly Shavasana. So in Shavasana, one can consciously breathe in such a way that as we breathe in, the abdomen moves out, and as we breathe out, the abdomen moves in. So abdominal breathing is better than thoracic breathing because more air can be moved with relatively less effort. Is the endogenous pharmacy as good as the drugs administered? There's a remarkable similarity between some of the drugs that we give from outside and uh, the chemicals that reside within the body. Uh, for example, the painkillers. The painkiller, the most, most important painkiller we, we know is morphine and something similar to morphine, that is the endorphins, exist within the body. Now, we also manufacture many drugs which are, as, uh, which are similar to the chemicals found in the body and administer them from outside. For example, if insulin is deficient, we give insulin itself or something which acts like insulin. If thyroxine is deficient, we administer thyroxine from outside. Uh, so we administer many of the chemicals which are there in the body from outside when they are deficient in the body. But then is what is within the body as good as the drugs administered, which is better? Uh, now, the endogenous pharmacy, that is the chemicals residing within the body, are not acting in isolation. They are part of uh, a teamwork. The teamwork which involves not only those chemicals, but also the places where they act, other chemicals which can interact with them. And uh, the, they also interact with the signals that are generated uh, to when the, that chemical is necessary or when that chemical is no longer necessary. So it's part of a coordinated network. Uh, it's part of uh, a chain of events. And, uh, and therefore, uh, the endogenous pharmacy is much better. The endogenous pharmacy is much better because in that, the chemical release is just in the right amount, at the right time, at the right place, and makes the place ready to receive the drug. Because uh, the action of the drug depends upon very often the type of receptors that are present on the cells on which it has to act. And uh, in case of uh, the chemicals re released within the body, when there is a need, not only there is a signal sent for the release of that chemical, simultaneously there are also mechanisms for increasing the number of receptors in the cells on which that chemical will act. And the result is that the chemical is able to act much better and it will not act at other places where the receptor population has not gone up. So that's why it is able to act at the right place. So it acts in uh, it's just the right amount at the right place and acts on the right place because the number of receptors there has gone up. On the other hand, the drugs which are administered from outside, they arrive in heroic doses, not at the best time, at the time at which we want to give. And we only try to mimic nature. We don't always know what is the best time to give and what is the right amount to give. 
We give heroic doses because we may give it to the mouth or to the blood. And uh, therefore, only a little bit may reach the place where it is really needed. And uh, the result is that this heroic dose circulates all over the body, goes just about everywhere in the body. And those parts of the body have not been prepared to receive it. The place where it is needed, that has also perhaps not been prepared through the increase in the receptor population. So that's why this chemical cannot can try to mimic, but can never really duplicate the type of action which we get from the chemicals which are released within the body from the endogenous pharmacy, that is the pharmacy built within the body. Now I'll digress a little bit uh, to the very idea of questions. Uh, because somehow our uh, education does not really prepare us for asking good questions. That is, uh, and the price that we pay is uh, by not generating enough of new knowledge when the products of the school education are grown up and should be in a position to generate new knowledge when they go to college, they do some research and so on. Uh, but uh, uh, that, that does not happen to the extent it should. So our failure to generate new knowledge is because we do not, uh, we don't just ask, I mean, we don't ask questions. And further, just having curiosity is not enough. Converting that curiosity into a good question, formulating a good question properly, uh, which can be subjected to research is what is at the key, uh, what is at the heart of research, at the heart of generation of new knowledge. Now, this is the cover of a book uh, that I became instrumental in writing in 1986. It was published by the National Book Trust in 1986. It is a book about our body and is addressed to five to eight year old children. It's a picture book. And uh, uh, this book is still going strong, has been translated into more than a dozen Indian languages, apart from the original that was written in English. Uh, now, what I was coming to is that uh, I had a lot of arguments with the editor of the book, the editor at the National Book Trust, about the last page of this book. Because uh, she said, well, this is not necessary. You know, I talked about the whole body in the book. Why on the last page, these few sentences? And let's see what these sentences are, which she thought were completely redundant and unnecessary. You now know something about the way your body works, addressing the child, the child who has read the book. You now know something about the way your body works, but there is still a lot more to be learned. So the first thing that the child is being told, that although you feel that now you know everything about the heart and the lungs and the blood and so on, there's still a lot more to be learned. We can learn more by asking questions. Now, this is the process by which we learn more. Questions lead to answers. Unless we ask a question, how will we get the answer? Answers which nobody knew earlier are called discoveries. So people have been asking questions. Answers have been coming. People have been making discoveries. And there's a lot more to be learned, which means there's a scope for asking more questions. And uh, by addressing those questions, we may get answers, and those answers will be discoveries. So it means there's a scope for further discoveries because there's still a lot more to be learned. So keep asking questions. This is encouraging the child to ask questions. And it's possible that you too may make some discoveries because that is the process. Questions will lead to answers and those answers will be discoveries. The discoveries that you might make, that you make might then get into books such as this one. So this book is full of knowledge, which has been generated by asking questions. And since everything is not yet known, you can also ask questions and uh, the answers that you get will be the discoveries that can make this type of a book more complete, fill this book with the knowledge which did not have, uh, which didn't exist earlier. And therefore, your discoveries could also get into books such as this one. Now, this makes the child feel confident. Yes, I can do it. It's not some other people somewhere else uh, who are capable of generating new knowledge. So this sums up in a way, of course, in a childish way, and also uh, in a rather unrealistically optimistic way, uh, generating a type of hope which may not be always fulfilled in the 
uh, lives of uh, all the readers of the book. But all the same, it sums up the process of research in a few sentences, encourages the child to ask questions, and tells the child how is it that new knowledge is generated, and that it's not generated by people who have uh, four hands or uh, uh, four eyes. It can be generated by people like you. There are also ordinary people who generate knowledge. So this uh, uh, importance of asking questions, encouraging children to ask questions, and uh, uh, helping children uh, in a gentle way, formulating the questions better, is something which uh, is an important part of education of the mental part of the being, which can help us generate new knowledge. Now, from questions, we move to a few statements, a few points to ponder. This is a, a humorous one, but at the same time, a hard-hitting one. No one has ever drowned in sweat, which means take exercise, work hard. It doesn't hurt anybody. No, no one ever died of overwork, and nobody ever drowned in sweat because of exercise. Well, this is a type of statement that is very often made. Yes, one should have a healthy lifestyle, but once in a while one can make an exception. It won't matter because uh, exercise, eating, all these things have long-term effects. And uh, it's what we do generally do over a long period of time that translates into good or bad health. So once in a while, it should be all right to miss exercise. Once in a while, it's okay to overeat. Once in a while, it's okay to eat the wrong kind of food which we enjoy eating. Well, to some extent, yes, one should not be so obsessed with uh, a rigid routine that uh, uh, missing some exercise on a day or indulging in food occasionally should itself become a source of stress. Because in the field of health, we have seen it is mind over matter. So if we are under stress, that can undo all the good things that we are doing in terms of physical factors. So once in a while, it should be okay. But then the question arises, what does this once in a while really mean? How often is once in a while? There's no clear-cut answer to this. What is this once in a while? Well, one interesting way of putting it would be that doing it just once and then not doing it for a while. And that while should be such that we have by then forgotten when it was that previous once that we did it. But then uh, that will always remain subjective this once in a while part. But then is there something that is not okay even once in a while, no matter what the definition of once in a while is? Is there something which even once can be harmful? Yes, smoking even one cigarette is harmful. That is one. But uh, what is more important for uh, most of us is uh, that... Uh, Heavy, high-fat meal, even once, can become risky for a person who has partly blocked coronary arteries. And most of us would have partly blocked coronary arteries after a certain age. So if superimposed on this partial block due to the blockage by fatty deposits is the spasm, that is sustained contraction of the coronaries that can block the blood supply to a part of the heart and that can lead to a heart attack. And uh, there are other factors which we have talked about, which can also uh, lead to the spasm in the blood vessels, which if it is superimposed on the partial block, can lead to a cutting off of the blood supply to that part of the heart and give, us, give the person a heart attack. Now, what are those other factors? Cold exposure, heated argument, smoking, drinking, and so on. So a person returning from a party in winters, uh, getting into an argument or an animated discussion, even if it was a pleasant discussion, but an animated discussion with somebody, and uh, then having a drink, smoking, and then having a heavy, high-fat meal. All this may be only once in a while, but then the person comes out 
walks to the car through cold weather, cold exposure gets added to it. And then he comes home and gets a heart attack. Now, what explains this is uh, this factors which came together, although it was only once in a while. So heavy, high-fat meal, even once in a while, is not okay. We all love sweet food. And uh, particularly people with sattvic tendencies, that's what the Gita says, that if you have a sattvic temperament, you will look like sweet foods. But then uh, uh, sugar is treated as a white poison these days. But then one can avoid sugar. There's strictly speaking, no need for sugar. How much sugar we do need in a day? Zero grams, nothing. Because people existed, survived, and stayed quite healthy even when the technology for extracting sugar from sugar cane did not exist. But all the same, sugar is not the only thing that is sweet. Sugar is sweet, but so are dates, raisins, mangoes, apples, grapes, and even carrots. So it's all a question of, again, it's in the mind. Uh, one can enjoy sweet, but then the sweet doesn't, sweet taste doesn't necessarily have to come from something that contains sugar. How about fasting? Is it good for health? Yes, it is good for health. And therefore, it can be more than a ritual. It is good for health, as well as good for our spiritual development. And therefore, it's more than a ritual. It's good for health because it gives an exercise to those mechanisms in the body which keep our blood sugar normal even when food has not been taken for some time. So after we take food, yes, the blood sugar has a tendency to go up and this is kept in check by the release of insulin. But then how about the interval between two meals when we are not eating? The blood sugar is kept up by another set of hormones which uh, work in a way, in a way, opposite to the way insulin works by raising the blood sugar. Now, these mechanisms seldom come into play if we keep eating very frequently. In contrast, when we fast, these mechanisms get a chance to work. And if anything in the body works, it gets better if it is not used uh, sort of uh, becomes sluggish, it uh, becomes weak because of disuse, not being used. And therefore, this capacity to maintain blood sugar in the fasting state gets good exercise. It is jogged every time we fast. And therefore, this capacity remains intact. This capacity gets better. So that is one. But then apart from that, Fasting also gives us uh, self-control. We learn to control our well. It also gives us the capacity to uh, withstand uh, missing a meal without getting upset because there can be situations in which food is not available. This person has been fasting, so this person knows, yes, I fast regularly, nothing happens. So today also nothing will happen. So nothing like uh, being able to remain uh, completely calm even when one is missing a meal due to one compulsion or the other. So it may not, one who observes a fast uh, regularly, voluntarily, can easily observe one more fast when circumstances demand it, when some of food is not available. In fact, that is how much of uh, mankind has lived in the past. Uh, this phenomenon of uh, getting a meal predictably at fixed times three or four or more times a day is a relatively recent phenomenon. Uh, when man did not live in the type of civilization that we have today, uh, he also had to sometimes wait uh, till food became available. When it was available, he overate. And when it was not available, he could be fasting for long periods of time. And animals live like that even now. And therefore, uh, these mechanisms in the body, which, uh, are, which let us overeat, put on some weight, when food is available, that's during periods of plenty, and uh, mechanisms which keep us alive when uh, food is not available in periods of scarcity, both these types of mechanisms they devil, uh, are there in the body, and that is what has made survival possible. Uh, animal survival even today, and even human survival till relatively recently 
in human history. So those mechanisms can be kept in good shape and one can develop self-control. Is there anything else that fasting can do? Yes, fasting can also help us think of those who do not have food. We can go on a fast voluntarily or not eat voluntarily and instead offer food to someone who is hungry. So those are ways in which we can uh, actually use fasting as something uh, which is designed for spiritual growth. So fasting is can be more, can be at least, it's not always more than a ritual, but can be more than a ritual. Now besides uh, food and exercise, sleep deprivation is another very important factor which is developing as a contributor to lifestyle diseases. And even when people try to correct their lifestyle, they are able to correct uh, their diet, they are able to start some regular physical activity. But what uh, they find more difficult these days, especially young people, is to sleep enough. That is one thing I can't correct. That's what they confess. But then the fact is that for those who are sleep deprived, the difference between the duration of actual sleep, that is what they actually, the duration for which they actually sleep, and that which is desirable, is seldom more than two hours. Just a question of two hours. If one can save those two hours sometime during the day, then one can sleep more and still have the same amount of time available for work. And saving two hours a day is not all that difficult. There, if we think we, there will be many activities which were unnecessary, on which we spent some time, and many types of things that we did inefficiently. We spent much more time on them than was necessary. Uh, we could have done those things more efficiently. So by eliminating certain things from our daily routine and by doing certain things much more efficiently than we do, uh, we can easily get those additional two hours for sleep. And uh, the efficiency with which we are able to do certain things would in turn depend upon adequate sleep. So if we sleep adequately, we'll be able to compensate for this additional sleep directly as a result of this additional sleep by improving our efficiency. Well, after all, how much time can one save by sleeping less? Not more than two hours generally. And the day has 24 hours. That is something which cannot, one cannot increase. Nobody's day can have 30 hours if one wants. At least that is one constant in life, one thing with respect to which everybody is equal. Everybody has only a 24-hour day, and out of that, just two hours to find two hours should not be all that difficult. Once again, mind over matter. Bernie Siegel, the cancer surgeon who's one of the pioneers in the field of body medicine, our mental attitudes affect first our susceptibility to disease. That's psychoneuroimmunology. That is the mind working through the nervous system to uh, affect our immune system. So when we are under stress, the competence of the immune system goes down. The immune system becomes less competent. When we are at peace, the immune system improves. And on the immune system depends our susceptibility to disease. If, they, if we are at peace, the immune system is competent we are less susceptible to disease. But once in a while still, we will fall ill. The same thing, that is uh, our mental attitude in turn affecting our immune system and our healing uh, mechanisms in general. They also, the mental attitudes also affect, therefore, our ability to overcome it. Because the self-healing mechanisms are also closely linked to the immune system and all healing mechanisms uh, benefit from our mental attitude. Now, a few tips for good health. This is from a science journalist, Michael Pollan, but uh, in a very few words, there are some very valuable things that he has said. Eat food, not much, mostly plants. Now, the first one seems a little funny. Eat food. If it is not food that you'll eat, what will you eat? 
That is because if you look at uh, many processed foods, they have many ingredients which are not really food. Ingredients like emulsifiers, preservatives, artificial flavors, artificial colors, and so on and so forth. They are not strictly speaking food. So eat food, avoid the rest. Not too much. Because what we eat is important. How much we eat is also important. And how we eat is also important. Mostly plants. What we eat, if it's mostly plants, that's good. Of course, within plants, we have seen that the cereal pulse mixture is a good combination for giving us enough of good quality protein. These grains, that is cereals and pulses, should be unrefined as much as possible. Then fruits and vegetables and so on. So mostly plants. Eat food, not too much, mostly plants. Another important uh, caution, all fat diets are bad diets. From uh, this physician, Dr. Stanley Davidson, whose uh, book, Principles and Practice of Medicine, uh, has been one of the most popular books for uh, perhaps now more than 50 years. We often measure markers like uh, the blood cholesterol level, triglycerides, and uh, the C-reactive protein, uh, homocysteine levels. Some of these markers are present in milligram and uh, nanogram quantities, minute quantities. But then we don't uh, really pay enough attention to the marker of uh, virtually all lifestyle diseases which staring at us in kilogram quantities, overweight. Now, overweight is the mother of the majority of lifestyle diseases, directly or indirectly. Now, Good life, good laugh. A good laugh and a long sleep are the two best cures for anything. It's an Irish proverb, but then again, sums up two of the most essential requirements for uh, good health, emphasizing sleep once more, not food, not exercise, but along with that, a good laugh, being happy. Finally, what is the focus of all this that we have been talking? What should be the preoccupation? Is it just being physically healthy or is it something else? Now, firstly, what is the right sequence for staying healthy? It's mind over matter. And therefore, the important thing is, if we are happy, we'll be healthy. Be happy, that will make us healthy. But then how can we be happy? By being good. Are we good because we are happy or are we happy because we are good? That's a dilemma that is uh, uh, ancient. Victor Hugo uh, gave, uh, spelled it out very clearly in his novel, La Miserable. Uh, are we good because we are happy or are we happy because we are good? The time-tested answer is that we are happy because we are good. So be good, you will be happy. And if you are happy, you will be healthy. But then what does being good mean? Being good means essentially being a person who loves, who is full of love. And uh, through love, we'll be happy and we'll be healthy. So essentially it boils down to love. That remains the key to good health as well as to spiritual growth, which is the purpose of life. So when we are talking about all this, uh, the focus seems to be on the body. The focus seems to be on bodily health. But in fact, uh, being healthy is not by itself the end. One also has to ask, why be healthy? We have to be healthy to fulfill the purpose of life. 
And how can I fulfill the purpose of life? Through love. And how can I be healthy? Again, through love. So the two converge. So the purpose of life and being healthy are not only compatible, they give us a better reason for doing everything that we are doing. So what we are doing in terms of exercise, in terms of diet, in terms of sleep, etc., we get a better reason for it. Not just a fear of disease and death, but making life itself meaningful. That is what you get. And so the key factor remains love, and that is what comes almost at the end of Savitri, to feel love and oneness is to live. So to feel that love, which is inspired by oneness, makes life meaningful. That is what living is about. So all this that we have been talking all these days about staying healthy is not just about being healthy. Being healthy itself can be a means to a higher end. And that higher end is to fulfill the purpose of life. And that in turn is through love. And the expression of love is giving. But then is it, still the focus remains on myself. I want to be healthy because I want to grow spiritually. I want to grow spiritually because that is the purpose of life. So it is again me at the center of it all. Is it all about myself? Or does this giving, which requires somebody to receive, also have implications which go beyond myself? And uh, that is something important because uh, uh, even if it starts with myself, the fact that I inspired by that oneness to love and then I express this love by giving, it is basically what's happening is that I am changing as a result of my level of consciousness going up. And uh, when I do that, I'm not only uh, doing it for myself, it is also inspiring somebody else. It is radiating an influence. The one who is receiving is also growing spiritually through it. We grow spiritually not only by giving love, but also by receiving love. And therefore, through this type of uh, radiation, through this type of uh, 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 influence that uh, spreads through contagion, because uh, we are affected by our surroundings. So the result is that if more and more people start living a life which goes beyond their little self, even in the field of spirituality, and start thinking of the wider implications of this. Uh, one finds that it is not entirely about myself. It can have an effect on uh, the evolution of consciousness on this planet. And that is what Sri Aurobindo's and the Mother's philosophy is essentially about. That if more and more people start engaging consciously in this process of spiritual growth and uh, uh, grow, spiritually, they'll become more loving, more caring, they'll be more willing to share. And uh, through that, they'll be able to uh, raise the average level of human consciousness. Because if more and more people are doing it, then the numbers determine the average. The average level of human consciousness will go up. And when the average goes up, the typical human nature changes. Because it's the level of consciousness that, that translates into human nature. So the typical human nature changes when the average goes up. And therefore, the world can become a much better place to live in. So the chain is, we start with individuals. Individuals who are consciously fulfilling the purpose of life by loving and giving. But then it does not remain restricted to the individual. It becomes a mass phenomenon. It becomes a mass phenomenon because of many things. Uh, but the fun thing fundamental to it is that there is an evolutionary thrust at the moment on this planet. 
mental consciousness has gone to a level where it has more or less reached its peak. And the planet is now poised for the next leap in evolution. And because of this evolutionary thrust, it is likely that more and more people will take to the spiritual path. And if they do it consciously and realize that uh, this is something that is going beyond myself, it is a collective process, then it becomes more truly collective because consciousness of this process being collective is also important. And uh, then, you know, uh, as a result, what happens is that when you are giving, you are giving to individuals, you are giving to uh, fellow beings, you are giving to uh, other forms of creation. But at the same time, uh, this giving is not to those people or to those plants or to uh, those creatures. It is giving to the divine in them. Because uh, once again, what can happen is that if one becomes conscious of this uh, wider implication, it can look like an enormous task. Either one can feel that uh, I'm engaged in this enormous task and therefore get a magnified ego, or one can feel discouraged that how can I do all this as an individual? This is too much to change the world. We are not out to change the world. We are just doing what I'm supposed to do. And uh, everything else becomes a byproduct. My uh, the fulfillment of the purpose of my life becomes a byproduct. The change in typical human nature becomes a byproduct. Everything else is a byproduct. So all I have to do is to just love and give. So uh, get the joy of uh, loving and giving and forget about yourself, forget about the implications. And uh, this loving and giving is for the divine. Give to the divine in the creation of the divine. and forget about oneself uh, in the process. Because the wider the one expands, the more the ego circle expands, the less one thinks about oneself. So if it is for the world, what is the focus? The focus is the divine, and the divine is infinite. So when the focus is infinite, there's essentially no focus, there's just love. And uh, if this loving becomes habitual, then it just becomes a part of being. So just love then translates to just be. Be what you are, because then love comes spontaneously. One can't do otherwise. As the mother has said, to know is good, to live is better, to be that is perfect. Having the knowledge is good, but then that's not sufficient. To live is better, to put into practice that knowledge is better, and to be that is perfect. To be means uh, to live that knowledge constantly and spontaneously. So if uh, one has to love, that to be that love means that love should be constant and spontaneous. It has become a part of one's nature. And it has become so much a part of nature that one can't act otherwise. That is one feels that is the only way to live, that's the only way to be. And uh, that is how the world can change. Uh, this is uh, from Sri Aurobindo Savitri. Thus shall the earth open to divinity and common natures feel the wide uplift. So the earth is becoming more and more to expression of the divine. The divinity is hidden in all aspects of creation, right from matter to man. But uh, we are not open to expressing that divinity. The expression will in increase. This is that uh, inevitable progress of uh, inevitable evolution of consciousness for which the earth is now poised. Thus shall the earth open to divinity and common natures feel the wide uplift not just some exceptional saints and sages and rishis, but the common people. They'll feel this wide uplift, illumine common acts with the spirit's ray and meet the deity in common things. So it's not something unusual that has to be done. Common acts will be done in a different spirit because they'll be illumined by the spirit's ray and meet the deity in common things, see the divine in common things. Nature shall live to manifest secret God the manifestation will improve. The divine is always there. God is always there, but will manifest more. 
the spirit shall take up the human play. The human play, the way we live our everyday lives will be taken up by the spirit, which is uh, the spark of the divine in manifestation. Spirit is universal. The spirit of the divine is universal. The soul is individual. But essentially, the spirit is divine because it's the divine essence. The soul is divine because the soul is the divine essence in the individual. The spirit shall take up the human play, which means the human actions, the way human life is lived, will be in keeping with the spirit, the law of the spirit, the law of the divine, which is the law of divine love. That is what it was, shall take up the human play. Because there will be no barrier, there will be no screen that will be that will make the that spirit obscure. Spirit will have a direct action, uninhibited action, unobstructed action in the human affairs. And this earthly life become the life divine. That will what is change the world. That is what will make the earthly life life divine. Now looking ahead at the This is the last uh, day of the current series of YES courses, YES.04. And uh, the YES program, uh, which was inspired by the 150th anniversary of Sri and the 75th anniversary of India's independence, uh, brought together these three interrelated things, yoga, education, and spirituality, because in fact, the three are one. Yoga is education because education is basically about uh, going from where we are to where we sh can be, where we should be, bringing out the best in us. That is what education is about. And uh, therefore, true education can remain only incomplete without spirituality. Unless we bring in spirituality, we'll be only perfecting the instruments, the body and the mind and not providing in this education guidance on how these instruments should be used. And what is spirituality? When we Spirituality can be just philosophy, but when we put it into practice in daily life, that becomes yoga. So yoga is the technology, whereas spirituality is the science. Putting spirituality into practice, applying spirituality in daily life, it's what yoga is about. So yoga, education, and spirituality, they are closely interlinked. Now, all this program would not have been possible without the YES team. And uh, here is the team. Uh, some of you, uh, some of them you have seen, some of them not much, but all the same. Each one of them has contributed immensely to this program. Without them, it would not have been possible. Uh, Aditi, of course, you have been seeing almost every day, although she shuns limelight. And uh, uh, the rest of them also don't like to be seen much. They have been working and, uh, in one way or the other. This is that brother and sister team, Aditya and Arunima, whom you have uh, seen singing sometimes, but they are not just singers. Aditya is an engineer by qualification, and uh, the rest is his passion. And he spends more time on his passion than anything else. And Arunima, his sister, uh, she's an MBA with a finance background, but then she got, uh, and she had a good lucrative job with the corporate sector. She gave it up. Uh, to be able to do what she feels more passionate about. Uh, and she is the one who has been shooting all the videos you have seen uh, in the practical classes. All the pre-recorded videos have been shot by her. And this is Mitu, whom you have seen singing, but she's not just a singer. She is uh, also a PhD in education, uh, an academic supervisor, at, uh, academic supervisor at Cambridge School. And uh, apart from that, she's a devotee. And... She speaks in the Sunday satsangs. She has also given a yes talk as an educationist on listening spaces in schools. That is one of her, uh, that is one of the programs of which she has been the architect at Cambridge School, create an environment in which we encourage the children to speak. We listen to them so that uh, uh, we can, uh, so that they feel uh, sort of that confidence that this is a uh, person with whom I can share everything. Trust that this person will never do me any harm. This person truly loves me. This person has the time to listen to me. And 
uh, there are so many issues that young people have uh, uh, which they would like to discuss if only they have such a person available. Otherwise, they end to, tend to either go into a depression or they end up getting advice from wrong quarters. They may depend on peers who are equally immature and therefore they require that type of a listening space in schools and that's what she has created in her school. Uh, this person, again, you might have seen in a few videos, but then he's an engineer by qualification who uh, not only makes educational toys using the technology in which he's an expert, but also runs uh, where several workshops for business people in general so that they can bring spirituality into their business. And this person is uh, Dr. Mankul Goyal. He's a skin specialist, uh, but a skin specialist who goes deeper than the skin. Uh, he is uh, also an expert on uh, the microbiome on which he has spoken in some of the YES programs and also given a YES talk on this subject. He's an expert on the microbiome. And uh, apart from that, he's also in Ayurveda and uh, other holistic systems of medicine. Sonika is uh, a, a faculty member in, a, in the University of Delhi in a college in, affiliated to the University of Delhi in computer science. She's a computer scientist. And uh, Vidya, again, a PhD in psychology. She's a counselor. She counsels young people and their parents uh, for uh, things related to career, examination stress. She also counsels uh, uh, people who uh, may be going through stress because of other reasons. For example, many people lost their jobs during COVID and uh, she has been counseling such people who are undergoing stress because of having lost their jobs, et cetera. So uh, she's again uh, into the type of work which she uh, is passionate about and uh, through which she's able to give a lot to those who need the type of expertise she has. So you can see it's a highly accomplished team. Uh, we have two uh, psychologists, both PhDs in psychology, and uh, we have two engineers, Aditya and uh, Amit, and uh, we have an educationist here in Mithu, and we have two medical doctors. And of course, uh, we have this person who has worked with the corporate sector and deliberately waited to do something what she's passionate about. So a highly skilled team, highly qualified team uh, who has deliberately chosen to spend a considerable amount of time during the last more than one year on uh, the mother's work. The mother doesn't need only unskilled workers. The mother has work for all of us and that is what they have enjoyed doing during the last more than one year. How this team came together is itself a miracle. That itself is the mother's grace because uh, everybody who, anybody who is uh, getting old, like me, starts thinking of having a second line who will continue the work. But then everybody also, also realized how difficult it is to build a second line. I had not been able to do it through all my career, which had been uh, maybe around 50 years of my career. I had not been able to do it. But when this thing had to happen, it was interesting how it happened so quickly. It happened within a period of six months, apparently, more or less. The whole team came together during this COVID period when it was becoming difficult to have physical courses and we were toying with ideas of what, how to make use of this new technology of which I knew very little and even now don't know much. Somehow, through one excuse or the other, one occasion or the other, the team came together and uh, started working as a team. Vidya joined us rather late, but then she has taken to the whole program as a fish takes to water. And uh, you already heard from her at least two talks in the YES program. The third one is in the offing very soon and uh, two short videos. She has, and more than that, I mean, she has been contributing to the energy and uh, the uh, spirit of the whole program. So that is the team. Uh, each one of them has played an indispensable role uh, in the whole program. And uh, some of them have been visible, some of them have been not so visible, and some others 
who are not in the picture have also contributed in their own way. For example, Preeti Bhardwaj, uh, you've seen, uh, she has, in spite of being in Canada, every time she visited India, she uh, helped us uh, pre-record a few videos in the practicals, apart from, of course, bringing all the encouragement and love, which uh, helps us. So there have been so many more that we have also contributed in different ways, but this has been sort of the core team uh, which has contributed in one way or the other to this program and will continue to run it because so far as I'm concerned, this was the last course uh, of this type that I have probably done and uh, may not be able to make this sort of a commitment uh, again. But then I'm not indispensable. The work will continue. All these young people are there. Uh, this is uh, an inside view, a recent view of Sri Ashram's Delhi Branch Meditation Hall. This is a recent addition to the Meditation Hall. Uh, the Sri and the mother, as they used to sit on the Shindis. We love to hear from you. Uh, any questions or comments are welcome. And uh, the email address is yes at yesspirituality.com. Gratitude to the mother and Sri Aurobindo for uh, making these courses possible and bringing all of us, the Yes team, together. And thank you all for uh, providing this opportunity and. Uh, hope that uh, this will continue to be, uh, this material that we have generated in these four modules will continue to be seen by more and more who need it. The mother will guide them to the channel and to the videos. But then you can be the mother's instruments. All of you can be the mother's instruments. If you liked the program, subscribe to the YouTube channel if you haven't. Pass on the word to the people whom you know. Uh, do them a good turn by telling them about uh, these videos that exist on the YouTube channel and to which we'll keep adding more and more as time goes along. That process will continue. And more courses may also come up from the younger members of the team. So maybe we can end today's class with and close in silence. Thank you, everyone. Mm -hmm.